Hello, I'm Sam Kelton with Triangle Pump Components, and today we're teaching a class on atmospheric pressure and vapor pressure as related to pump cavitation. So I invite you to join the classroom, the other people that are here, as we go through this presentation. Now, if you're experiencing a pop or being or a bang in your reciprocal plunger pump, or you're experiencing a lot of vibration in the line, then you probably have a cavitation problem. And understanding atmospheric pressure and vapor pressure are key to understanding cavitation in some of its causes. So, the first thing that we need to understand is that air has weight. It has pounds per square inch. It, it creates pressure on the earth. So as the earth, out, as our altitude increases, the air is thinner, it has less weight. As we get closer to the earth, the air is thicker, it's more dense, and we have more weight, more pounds per square inch. It's an important element. So to illustrate this, let's use a swimming pool and spud the pump mechanic. He's in a 10 by 10 by 8 foot deep swimming pool. As we layer water on top of this pool, we find that the pounds per square inch increases. So at two feet, we have 12,400 pounds of weight, four feet, 24,900 pounds of weight, and so on to eight feet, we have about 50,000 pounds of weight that's layered into this pool. The pounds per square inch increase as the weight of the water increases, we start at two feet with 0.87 pounds per square inch. At the bottom of the pool, we have 3.47 pounds per square inch. And so we see that more water, more weight, more pounds per square inch. The Earth's atmosphere works in the very same way. As we get closer to the bottom, which would be the surface of the Earth, we see that we would have more weight, more pounds per square inch. Now, this relates to vapor pressure because as the, the, earth, the weight of the Earth's atmosphere increases, it can inhibit vapor from being formed and water from boiling, as a matter of fact. Here we have a pot, we have a fire lit under it, we have molecules excited and releasing vapor bubbles as we reach the boiling point or vapor pressure. These bubbles are going from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. They naturally move in that direction. So they're being released into the atmosphere and going into a gas form. Now, at the same time, the Earth's atmosphere, the weight of the Earth's air, is actually pushing down against the top of this pot and it's keeping vapor bubbles from being formed because there's just a blanket weight on top of it. Okay, to relate this in a different way, we have Spud the pump mechanic. He's trying to fix dinner. He's trying to boil potatoes, his favorite meal. And so here he is. He's at sea level. And at sea level, there's 14.7 PSI, pounds per square inch atmosphere of weight pressing down on this boiling pot. And at, at 14.7 PSIA, it takes 212 degrees Fahrenheit of heat to cause water to boil. Now, if we put spud on top of a mountain at 10,000 feet, there's less air, there's less PSIA, there's 10.1 pounds of PSI, pounds per square inch atmosphere, so there's less weight pushing down on the top of this pot and what we can do now is we can boil water at 194 degrees Fahrenheit. So with that in mind, I want to cover a little bit of pump terminology before we move forward. These are terms that you will need to know if you're dealing in the pump industry. Net positive suction head. This is the suction pressure that's at the inlet of a pump for reciprocal pump or any type of pump. Let me, I'll draw this for you if you'll give me just a second. So, this is the fluid end from the front on a reciprocal plunger pump. Okay. 
okay? And here we have the suction side on the bottom, the discharge side on the top. This is the suction inlet, so we have piping running in here, fluid moving toward the pump, NPSH, net positive suction head, is measured right here at this inlet. Fluid's moving out on the discharge side, coming in on the suction side. This is where we measure NPSH, or the suction pressure against the pump. NPSHR is net positive suction head required. This is a number that is supplied by the pump manufacturer. And it's, it's a measurement of how that pump or its requirement of pressure, suction pressure for that pump to run efficiently. And the thing that you need to realize about net positive suction head required is that it's figured under perfect condition. Everything is absolutely perfect for the pump. The, the suction pressure, ambient water, all the, con all the conditions are perfect when this is figured. This is kind of a fictional um, number because when we, when we actually put a, a pump into service, nothing's perfect. There, there's something that's gonna be different. And so you need to realize this when you're looking at this figure and add a little bit more suction pressure. NPSHA, net positive suction head available, is what is actually available to the pump when it's in service. And this is measured again right here at the pump inlet with a gauge. And what I want to point out here is in this equation to figure NPSHA and that positive suction head available is that one of the important elements is, is PA, which is atmospheric pressure in PSIA. So this becomes an important element in figuring what you actually have available at the pump. Acceleration is another one, head or lift is another one, so there are different elements, but uh, NPSHA is figured using atmospheric pressure, and atmospheric pressure then relates to vapor pressure. By the way, uh, I want to mention that this illustration is available on our website at Triangle Pump Components, Inc. If you'll search for that on the web, this coloring book is available to be downloaded so that you can look at all of these principles. You can study them and you can have fun coloring the coloring book at the same time. So here we have a cross section of a pump. In a reciprocal plunger pump, we have a fluid in and we have a power in and the power end will have a crankshaft, much like a car's crankshaft, that is moving a plunger back and forth. So here we have a discharge valve, we have a suction valve, we have the inlet here, which is here, a suction valve here, discharge valve here, the suction chamber here, and we have a plunger that moves back and forth, moving on the crankshaft, connected to the crankshaft. So if this plunger moves back, it's creating suction pressure and it's pulling the fluid in from the, from the inlet into this middle chamber, the suction chamber. This valve opens, this valve closes, and fluid flows in here. When the, fluid, when the plunger moves forward, it closes this valve and opens this valve and moves fluid then into the discharge chamber as this fluid is displaced, displaced and that's basically how a reciprocal plunger pump works. The thing to know about this is that as this plunger is moving back, it's creating areas of low pressure in, in the suction cycle. And the areas of low pressure will be here in the suction valve below the plate or the valve member as this fluid moves up in here. There are just natural pockets of low pressure in any valve. And then around the end of this plunger. And this is where then that you may have problems because if the suction pressure available to the pump falls below the vapor pressure of the liquid being pumped, then vapor bubbles can form and vapor bubbles cause cavitation. So 
here we'll see we see cavitation bubbles and again in this scenario the vapor pressure the the suction pressure has fallen below the vapor pressure of the liquid the everything the conditions are right to form vapor bubbles and so vapor bubbles are forming in that suction area in the pump and here we see as the plunger moves back this kind of a round vapor bubble has formed. As the plunger moves into the discharge cycle, then uh, let's get back to here. As it moves back into this discharge cycle, it's displacing fluid. This valve closes, this valve opens, fluid is pushed in here, and this is a smaller chamber normally. And uh, so it's, it's being pushed, this fluid's being pushed into a higher pressure chamber. Pressures are increasing here. And as that happens, then this vapor bubble that was formed because conditions are right, will start to take the shape of a donut. It'll be deformed and it'll start to take the shape of a donut. And as it does, then it's going to condense and condense and condense and eventually it will implode and will get a stream of high pressure water coming out of it. They look like this. So think about this. We're talking about many thousands of vapor bubbles that are being formed during this process. And as they're imploding, they're creating this high stream of water. Now, this water is at very high pressure and it cuts metal. It's like a CNC water jet that can cut through three, four, five, six inches of metal very easily. This thing will do the same thing. It's, it's terribly destructive. So we can see here this valve disc, and this is actual valve disc that this illustration was taken from. There's a lot of damage along here. These, these uh, pockets of, of damage were caused by this pinpoint stream. And it can be severe enough because you have thousands of these bubbles imploding at the same time. You get the noise in the pump, the, the beam pop bang noise and the vibration from the implosion in the pump. Uh, it can do things like this. This disc, this valve disc was blown in half by cavitation. The issue with that is, is that all this vibration, not only is it destroying the, the pump valves and, and different elements of the fluid in, but all that vibration is moving back into the power end and it can cause damage in the power end and eventually destroy the pump. So here we are at the end of the video. And the thing that I want you to take away from this is that atmospheric pressure at, uh, contributes to vapor pressure. Vapor pressure forms cavitation bubbles and cavitation bubbles are very destructive. Now, there's, again, this, this illustration is downloadable at trianglepumpcomponents.com. This is the first of a three-part video series the second part will go further into cavitation and the causes of cavitation. The third video will be the cures for cavitation and we'll have different coloring books that will discuss the principles of each of these. I hope this video has been helpful to you. If you have questions, come visit us at Triangle Punk Components Inc. on the web or give us a call. We'd be happy to help in any way we can. Thank you.